Thank you for joining us for this wonderful event we have planned for you this evening. Um, it's so nice to see all your lovely faces. My name is Jessica Wilson. I am the Director of Career Services at the University of the Incarnate Word, along with one of my team members, Andrea Garcia, who is a career advisor. Say hello, Andrea. We also have the Office of Parent and Alumni Relations, who will be introducing their team shortly. But before we get started, I would like to remind everyone the session is being recorded and it will be available for future viewing and sharing. Please be sure to keep your computers muted and your camera off during the session if you don't mind. And we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So please enter any questions in the chat area throughout the presentation. Um, I am looking forward to having our guests share their personal stories and backgrounds and um, especially on such an important topic and that is mentorship. Aside from their own personal experience, such topics will include how to seek mentorship, uh, the importance of getting involved on campus and outside in the community, building a mentor-mentee relationship in a digital world, uh, getting, uh, getting you to think about how to have um, or how you've helped a person through a leadership or career journey, as well as touching on COVID impact, which obviously we're, we're in the pandemic, so it's, it's a big topic. So uh, lots to discuss today, but before I pass the mic over to Dr. Lisa Mick in the Office of the Alumni Relations, let me do a brief introduction of our wonderful alumni and panelists for today. We have Josh Gonzalez, he graduated with an MBA in 2018, and he is the owner of Nine Round Fitness. We have Claudia Granado, who graduated with a BA in 2007, and she is an HR data analyst with Security Services Federal Credit Union. And then two of our most recent grads, Al Torres, who graduated with a BBA, Administrative Assistant for the Bottom Line Tax Services, and David Albert also graduated with a BBA, and he is a senior marketing officer. Renaissance Dental is who he works with. So thank you panelists for being here. And with that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Dr. McNary. Hi, welcome again, everybody. I'd like to introduce my team. I have Gabrielle Alvarado, Gabby. Gabby is the Associate Director of Alumni and Parent Relations. And then we have Jorge Jones. And Jorge is the coordinator Hello, of young alumni and volunteer services. All right. Thank you again. Now we ask you all to please mute your mic and to, um, to stop your video as well so that we can have just our panelists viewed at this time. Thank you all. This is going to be a very informative panel discussion, and it's the official kickoff to our UIW Alumni Mentor Program. Let's start off by asking all four of our panelists just a little bit about themselves. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Claudia Granado, um, and I've been with Security Service Federal Credit Union for two years now. And prior to security service, I was at the Texas Department of Transportation. Um, so I'm very happy to be part of this panel and hopefully I get to hear everybody's story. I'm so happy to be sharing mine. We'll go next. Hey guys, I am Josh Gonzalez. Uh, like they said in the intro, I operate and own Nine Round Kickbox Fitness here in town. I was uh, in San Antonio. I was uh, an MBA student last year, graduated at the end of last year, 2019. Feels like yesterday. Um, also a certified exit planner and certified personal trainer. Good, that, I'm, I'm blessed to be here. I'll follow up there, Josh. Uh, yeah, my name is David Albert. Um, I work for the uh, DFW Dental Offices Corporation. Um, for I am on their uh, Fort Worth branch, which is Renaissance Dental. Um, I am their senior marketing officer, so I handle a lot of their public relations, advertising, marketing, brand management. Um, I just recently graduated from UIW, as was stated. I uh, played football there throughout my entire two years 
to your career there to finish up school. I originally started at Alabama State University um, over my first two years of college, and that was where I got involved in uh, mentorship. And then I'll finish up. Uh, my name is Giselle Torres. I just graduated this past May as well um, with a major in international business and minored in Spanish and marketing. Um, I had a really wonderful time at UAW. Um, I studied abroad a couple of times, um, wasn't a, really involved. Um, and since graduation, I've been blessed with the job as an administrative assistant and as a bookkeeper at the bottom line tax services here in my hometown of San Marcos. Thank you all. Just a reminder to please keep your, uh, your mics muted. Everybody keep your mics muted and your video, keep your video off as well. Thank you all for your introductions. We'll start off with um, this first question. How have you found mentors throughout both your personal and professional life? Those who have guided us may not have always been labeled a mentor, but we all know someone who has helped us along the way. Claudia, would you like to start us off? Yes, of course. So I'll actually start off for my with my first ever mentor um, that I had at my first job that I, um, uh, it was a very long time ago. I want to say it was over 20 years ago. I was very young. Um, I hadn't started, uh, you know, my uh, degree with Incarnate Word yet. Uh, but I really looked up to, I, I started working in human resources and I, um, was offered a position just as the front desk person. And I just started working my way up, you know, learning everything. Uh, one of the uh, vice presidents of human resources, Teresa Sapansky, is the person that uh, I, you know, that inspired me actually to pursue my degree at Incarnate Word. Uh, so she's the reason that I, uh, you know, wanted to get into human resources. Um, she's the reason that I pursued the degree with Incarnate Word, and it took me four years of, uh, you know, going to school part time and working full time, and I had a two and a five year old. So it was not an easy journey for me, um, you know, to complete my degree, but uh, she definitely had a, a lot to do with me uh, getting into the degree program. Josh, would you like to go next? Yeah, I can go. So um, I think when I was looking and everything I've looked for in a mentor typically uh, comes out of the, the needs that I have personally, like the, the shortcomings, the areas where I suffer on, um, you know, I notice a gap in my performance or I'm really struggling to get somewhere. And so I start to ask myself, you know, who has done what I want to do before, I, before I've done it. And so um, as I look back on my career and my personal life, my spiritual life, all, all these areas, um, there, I look for those mentors who are generally accessible. Maybe they're close to me. Um, maybe, maybe I can follow them on and I'll just, I'll follow people on social media who are personalities, whether financial or business leaders, and they become like a pseudo mentor. I think of one um, recently, his name's Grant Cardone. He's a, he's a sales guy. And so, you know, he becomes a mentor. I follow what he does. And as long as his principles align with mine, I, I continue to look for him or to him for, for what he would do or what his organization would do. I think of uh, a pastor out in North Carolina. His name is Stephen Furtick. And I started following him and his church, Elevation, back in 2012, 2011, and started to mimic, you know, some of my personal speaking and, and uh, leadership skills based on him. But then I think about really accessible people like just, you know, uh, co-workers and bosses. And I remember doing interviews and I could never choose the right interview. I felt like my interviews were terrible. I was a, a manager at a telecom. And so my boss who became a mentor of mine, um, I asked him to join an interview. And I, I didn't know how to get to somebody's personality, like to, to really learn all about them. And I remember just inviting him in saying, hey, can you do an interview with me? 
and looking at his facial expressions. I know that was so simple at the time, but he was smiling. He was laughing with people he really didn't know. Like any answer they gave him, he had a big old smile on his face. And I really kind of introspected and I was like there taking notes. I was really intent. And so the interview when I did it was super uncomfortable, uh, but the interview when he did it, people were gregarious. They were talking to him. They're sharing all about his life and their lives. And I just remember taking that away from my mentors and just uh, asked him to mentor me around those competencies which he did for a significant amount of time. But uh, it was just the invite in and looking for the characteristics that I was weak on. I think that's where it started. Yeah, I, um, how I got involved in, um, in mentorship was um, throughout high school, I loved to um, help out at uh, football camps that I was attending. Um, whether it was mentoring the younger kids coming up and helping out with coaches. Um, I really started to get serious in mentorship in terms of business um, whenever I uh, met the organization of uh, mentors and mentees that I went through throughout college at Alabama State, um, TDI, Turning Dreams into Reality. Um, it was started by 12 uh, men uh, from the uh, Talladega, Dallas area that started a foundation um, to turn dreams into realities from uh, young men who are from disenfranchised areas to help them become great and successful. Uh, I uh, sat in on a presentation they gave at school, at my school, Alabama State at the time. Um, and I sat in and I listened to their stories and, and how they helped out each other and how they've helped out, um, how they've helped out young men and young women become great. And, uh, and I loved it. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted to find out how I could get involved. And it was an application process and I submitted my application and they, I was accepted and all throughout college um, until the end of my uh, college career this past May, they have always been there 24 seven for me to help with resumes, understanding how businesses work, how, uh, how, and um, how to produ conduct yourself in an interview, um, life tips, um, just great wisdom from amazing, amazing men. Um, some actually some of the most successful men in uh, the Birmingham uh, area region in Alabama. Um, so it, it was just awesome to learn from them um, throughout my entire college career, um, and even um, even in so uh, afterwards, um, even to today. Um, uh, so uh, just the importance of that in terms of how that affected my grades, how that affected how I conducted myself in the classroom and then the business standpoint of today, how I even left my office today, meeting with a client, uh, their handprint through that mentorship uh, program throughout my entire college career was insurmountable. Um, uh, the amount of um, the amount of impact that they had through, throughout my, uh, throughout my career in college. So, I mean, it's, it's just an amazing, amazing way how mentorship can really uh, make a difference in your life and how you are able to uh, perceive it throughout the future. Um, for myself, I had a couple of people that I saw as mentors on, uh, during my time at UIW. Um, the, my freshman year, uh, I had a class called um, Emerging Leaders and the director of that one was Dr. Zendejas and he worked for first year engagement um, and so his office and him really helped me out um, when it came to registration, um, when it came to picking classes, I would go to him and ask, um, do these classes work for me? Um, when I wanted to pick a minor, um, just learning more about what uh, minor I would need. So he really helped me out in terms of academics and just settling in to UIW, um, as well as my business school advisor. Um, she helped me out a lot. Um, and then um, as I was in classes, I really took advantage of going to my professor's office hours. Um, and just by doing that, I was able to create some valuable relationships with them, um, getting to know them. And then um, that really showed that I was interested not only in their class, um, but just doing more from, um, than just inside the classroom. Um, so for example, uh, Dr. Washington was one of my professors. Um, and I connected with him after um, attending one of the a field trip that we had to Rackspace. Um, and that really showed him that I was interested in class. 
Um, and he really helped to empower me um, to maybe seek position, uh, job positions in industries where women um, are not really that into. Um, so he was really great. Um, and he just offered me advice. Um, I had some recommendation letters from him as well. Um, later on um, last year, I went on a service immersion trip to Peru, um, which was led by WGC. That was an organization on campus, um, as well as Sister Martha, who is um, a really great leader on campus as well. And she has just helped me so much um, in networking with people, um, not even just here, but even around the world. We still have connections with women in Peru um, and indigenous women that I still connect um, now after I've graduated. Um, so I just really um, gained a lot of mentors by speaking to my professors and just getting involved on campus. Thank you all. Uh, now, this next question really was for Giselle and David because making memorable connections really starts from the moment that we have the opportunity to meet with others. So my question for Giselle and David was really how important was it to be involved on campus while a student at UIW? And I know you shared some of those already, but were there any special workshops or special groups that helped you develop those soft skills? And if you could please, um, help direct our participants, you know, where, where can they go? There, there's always a, a special professor or um, administrator that may help you along the way, but do you have some other tips for them as well? Uh, I, I believe someone who was really impactful for me on the UIW campus was uh, Miss Mandy Polito. Um, this was um, this was first off an amazing woman. Um, she is just so such a big heart and cares for so many people. Um, if anyone knows her on this panel, y'all know what you know. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, just someone who I could go to um, a lot and um, really help to you know understand all the emotions processing through uh, difficult classes, my hard capstone classes, um, and just being there for me and listening and, and giving advice that was non-biased advice um, to just help me grow. Um, I think that was key. Uh, I also think that ne the networking aspect of, that you shared, uh, Dr. Maneri, is very, um, very, uh, very prevalent. Um, I always had a, uh, I had a great friend of mine who passed away last year and um, very, very close to my heart, but he, he told me a really good, um, gave me really good advice. He told me, uh, you know, it, it's not really because I was really stressing with school and it was stressing me out. And he said, you know, David, it's not about the grades you make. It's about the hands you shake. Um, so just make sure to understand that. Yes, study hard, work hard. I'm not saying don't do that. But remember to look up at the person of who you're turning the paper to and talk to them. Um, and a lot of the reasons why I have a job right now is because of the connections that I made throughout um, throughout college. Um, I am employed now at DFW uh, Dental Offices Corporations uh, because of uh, their regional director, Gilbert Castillo, who was an old friend of mine um, through a church group that I had been at. Um, knew that I had been working hard, knew that I had been studying in school and was majoring in marketing. And after I had graduated, he had given me a call and said, hey, we had just had our, um, our lead guy kind of, you know, take leave. Um, we would like to bring you in for an interview. Uh, why? Because he knew who I was and he knew how I handled myself and he knew I was a hard worker throughout the relationship that we had had throughout my college career. Um, so while I do believe that, um, you know, grades are important, um, I, I just place, I have placed more, um, I have placed more importance on the people that I come across in every single day and not, not having, uh, not turning anyone away in terms of conversation um, from uh, whatever it may be, uh, whatever reasons it may be, um, to make sure to uh, say hi to everyone. So that's been a really important um, asset for me these past few years. Um, and then for me, um, my freshman year, I was, um, I had just moved to San Antonio and I was living in the dorms um, and I was super new to campus. I had maybe one person that I knew 
Um, and I remember just in the first few weeks, um, I knew that I had to do something and look for an organization to try and meet other people and get involved on campus. Um, and one of my friends invited me to Alpha Phi Omega. It's a national co-ed service fraternity on campus. Um, and that was, um, I remember going to the first information meeting and not really knowing uh, a whole lot of what I was getting myself into, um, but I ended up joining and it just helped me so much. Um, just from when I first started, um, we got to go and volunteer to a place downtown San Antonio um, where I got to connect with other members as well as network with the people hosting the event. Um, later on, we also volunteered with the basketball team, um, the children's shelter. And then the second semester, um, I was able to serve as recruitment chair. And um, I used to be super, super quiet and shy. And uh, just serving as recruitment chair really uh, helped me push myself to reach out to others and network. Um, and not only to motivate myself, but motivate others to get involved on campus. Um, other resources that I had um, from serving as an officer, um, I was recruitment chair, later also held uh, the position of historian. And then during my last year, I served as a president. And we had different conferences um, at least once a year. Um, and then just serving as an officer, gaining those leadership skills. And additionally, as we were recruiting new people, um, if they were quiet as well, like um, how I once was, um, I would just try to push them to uh, come out to events and just support them, um, whether it was academically or on a personal level, um, just trying to connect with as many people as possible. Um, so just joining an organization for me was what really, really helped me during my time at UIW. Um, and for everyone that's um, on the call, um, just really push yourself to try and find an organization. There's so many on campus, whether it's social, um, there's also professional organizations that maybe fit with your major um, or just different interests. Um, but that's probably my biggest um, advice would be to um, reach out and try to join something um, that can really push you to um, gain different skills. Thank you. And just a reminder to those just joining us, thank you for joining us to keep, please keep your mic um, muted and your video hidden as well. I would like to turn to Claudia and Josh now. How can you build that mentor-mentee relationship in a digital world since everything is Zoom or, or you know, Facebook Live and streaming? How, how do you build that relationship now? I actually had to, uh, I had a mentor uh, in Rio de Janeiro. So I worked for the Nature Conservancy um, and my job title was uh, HR specialist for Latin America. And so one of the reasons I got hired was because I speak Spanish fluently, I write it, I read it. Um, and the only thing is that um, the Spanish is a little different, right? So I needed to find somebody that was gonna help me navigate my way through the international world, right? Um, I've been doing Skype, uh, you know, for over 15 years, and I started Skype when I started building that uh, relationship um, with the HR specialist in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, one of the fun things about it is that, you know, in, in Rio, there's a huge hour difference to our difference. So the most challenging thing for me was the difference, uh, the time difference. Um, so sometimes I either had to work late and get on the call with him, or I had to get up really early to be on the call with him. Uh, but the good thing about it was that I got to travel to Rio de Janeiro, and I, I actually met my mentor in person. So it, it was an awesome relationship. I learned everything that I needed to learn. Um, to kind of do my job. Uh, so he definitely uh, was a huge, huge uh, uh, asset to, to me moving up in my career uh, in, with the organization. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, great question. Good points, uh, Claudia, about the, the gaps in different time zones and languages. And uh, most, most people, I think even probably don't even get to that point. Um, you know, when I was thinking of this audience, I was thinking, you know, you guys probably have a desire to be mentored, 
you want to be coached, you want to get better at something in your life. Um, maybe you, you can think of somebody right now where you admire them, right? You probably have, if you just kind of take five seconds, there's one person in your life you, you have this admiration for. Um, I don't know what they do. I don't know if it's because they're good uh, public speaking or if they're good with the technical job that you're looking to get. Maybe they're just good parenting or coaching. You have this admiration for them. And typically that's where the coaching mentor relationship stops. But I think if we're on this call, the panel has taken that desire and just pushed it a little bit further. It's not much what we've done, but we've just kind of had that one uncomfortable ask from these people in our lives where we say, hey, uh, David, I really like how you lead this organization. And I know you're a busy guy and I know you got a lot going on, but would you mind, you think it might be possible for you to mentor me maybe once a quarter, we can get on a call. Uh, an hour call, maybe even 30 minutes, and really talk about some of the things I'm struggling with that I see in you that you just do so fluidly and naturally. And I've had those conversations. I've scripted that out. It's kind of like um, your first date with that girl or that guy. Like you, you are afraid to be turned down. But to be honest, I've asked people and they've told me, uh, I, don't, I just don't have the time. Um, I've had a mentor who uh, we kind of, she ghosted me, I, I think it's the term. Uh, we stopped talking and like, we have never ever discussed why she stopped mentoring me. But I will say this, while she mentored me, um, it was an invaluable time. I took a lot away and, um, and I used that. But I think as a mentor-mentee relationship, um, in the virtual world, I think it's a huge advantage. You can be mentored, like Claudia said, from anywhere, uh, any people in the world can mentor you at this point. If you have the desire to get up when their schedule allows you to, and to get on a call and to be ready and prepared and have thoughtful questions and maybe, you know, send them, I would do this, is I would send them three questions that I'm really struggling with, right? you're gonna have some gap between your meetings and your connections with them. So really think through, what are you struggling with? What do you need help with? And then send them that prior to the meeting. You don't wanna get on this meeting on Zoom and be like, I have 20 questions, here we go. Da, 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 da. And then your mentor doesn't really have anywhere to go. They don't have the time to untangle your, your concerns. Uh, so really hone in on what is, where do you want them to make an impact? Um, it's a dual relationship. It's not just them giving you homework, which I think sometimes if you've never been in a mentor mentee relationship, you don't want the homework. So you never bridge that gap, but it's not about that. You can really say, this is what I'm looking help for. I heard it said, and I like David's uh, rhyming speech, but you know, people aren't looking for somebody to tell them what to do, that, that guy on a stage, right? The sage on the stage. They're looking for a guide on the side. They want somebody to come alongside them, coach them. And, and sometimes we have to figure it out ourselves. And I think our, my best mentee relationships are those people who really struggled and I could see them struggling with the competencies or the coaching elements or whatever. And they would bring stuff to me that I didn't know about. They would ask me, hey, have you heard of this um, book or have you heard of this content? And I would say no and share that with me. And they would get stuff out of it, but so would I because they were bringing stuff to the relationship. It's not just give and give or just take and take and take as a mentee you got to be ready to give. And, and that can come from all different sorts of angles. You might be at a place where you're like, what can I possibly bring to the table? And there's so much that every person on this call and every person listening to that you have that that's valuable, but you have to be able to be vulnerable to release that and to be prepared during those calls. So 
I would say in this digital world, this is like, this is like prime because somebody who's going to mentor you probably doesn't have an open calendar. I hope you're not going out there and saying that guy has a bunch of time. I want him to mentor me. I wouldn't do that. Uh, if somebody's busy, that's, that's like a sign that they're valuable and that's a sign that people need them and depend on them. However, they also probably structure their day. And so they schedule in advance and now they don't have to drive an hour. You don't have to drive an hour to get there. They can just pop on Zoom and have a meeting, but that doesn't go beyond Zoom. Uh, I think what we talked about is make sure when you're texting and you're, you're having these communications that you follow through. I mean, just sending a simple text and then having a call is probably not always enough is, you know, make sure there's clear, concise communication. If you send an email, they don't respond. A friendly follow-up. Hey, just, you know, I'm hoping you didn't miss this, but just in case, right? There's a friendly way to do it without just abandoning, abandoning the relationship and saying, oh, that person never responded, so they don't want to be my mentor. That's rarely the case. I mean, there's probably some people out there who don't, but that's rarely the case. And so I would just say, make sure, um, you know, go beyond texting, pick up the phone if you need to, but always, always have a, a plan on what you want to get out of the mentor mentee relationship. And don't be, don't be afraid to ask somebody who's probably already your mentor right now. Don't be afraid to already solidify, validate that relationship. You're mentoring me. What can we just make this official? You know, can you, can we just call it like, like you and me are in this together. You're going to coach me regularly. Let's just do it because I'm already taking up your time. I rather structure it better. Those are some of my recommendations, but uh, I love, I love coaching now and in a digital world, it just makes it so much easier. You know, this really is a great opportunity, not so much a challenge anymore, but a great opportunity to make those connections, not just in our own community, but go beyond in, in other states across the country and even across the world. We can learn so much from people all over the world. Our next question is, um, what are your expectations for a mentee? And Josh has already alluded to some of this but I'd like to hear from some of the other panelists as well. And, and Josh, you can jump in as well. Can each of you please give some tips to our audience of what you expect from a mentee, maybe some goal setting or a framework? Yeah, I, um, what, um, when I was, um, and I'm, I still currently am, um, in the, uh, in the TDI mentorship uh, mentee, uh, program, what they expect from us is always to uh, understand where your goals at are and, and 10 years down the road, uh, always be very well prepared in what you do, very diligent, always hardworking, because um, these are the foundations and core, po or core uh, standpoints that they, that they pillar off of uh, with their program. Um, and it's helped me a tremendous amount, um, not just as, and Josh put it perfectly, not just going, hey, Hey, um, hey, uh, Mr. DeGraw, what am I, uh, like, what can I do better? How do I do this? How do I do that? It's, hey, I have A, B, C point that I want to go through. Maybe even at that, maybe just an A, B um, on things that I've researched. I've, I've, um, I've done background studies on, and I know that this solving this problem is going to get me from A to B. Um, so being very clear and concise with what I want, where I want to get to and how they can help me. Um, I believe is huge. I believe is one of the biggest expectations that I believe that a mentee um, that should be put on a mentee. Claudia, would you like to share some expectations? Um, I agree. So time is definitely very valuable. So I, uh, you know, live by my planner. I have two of them. I have one in paper and one electronically. And if it's not in my planner, then I 
I don't commit to that. So definitely, you know, sending an invite calendar and getting it on that person's calendar will definitely help that relationship as well and the commitment to it. Um, I think for me is um, just really setting up a really good relationship with the mentee, um, just letting them know, them know that you're there for them, um, just in anything you can help. Um, maybe if they're, they might be scared at first um, to build that relationship, um, that can really settle down their nerves and really know that you're there to help them um, and just lead them in the right direction uh, so that they're not scared to reach out whenever they need. Yeah, and I think um, in some of my mentorship, so like I started off by describing a mentor I had. He was my old boss. He was very fluid and you could tell, I mean, not that he wasn't organized, but he is a social guy. That's what I loved about him. He had a high level of interpersonal skills. And so he wanted to socialize as well to get to know all of me. And I had to relax some of my agenda items, right? Because I would go to our meeting with this agenda and we would talk about two or three points back to David's point. Maybe it's not A, B, and C. Maybe it's just A you get to, but I still found value in that coaching. Whereas there's other mentors um, that I've had in my life. I had a uh, a mentor that was very structured. She wanted a, a agenda. And then we just hit those bullet points and we went through. So being flexible on who your mentor is. And if you're a social person, you might want somebody who's a little bit more structured than you. Uh, and if you're not so social, you're structured, you might want the social person because just going through the bullet points doesn't always uh, benefit the mentee. Sometimes learning what drives that person is critical to a mentor really being effective in their in their uh in their coaching so i would just say you know kind of learn their personality and and adapt as uh, things go along from an expectation standpoint thank you we had a, a great comment from sean freeman who's in the audience and he said being clear and concise helps the mentorship process go a lot smoother. I think we can all agree with that. Now, uh, Josh and Claudia, how have you helped a person through a leadership or career journey? And David and Giselle, y'all can jump in as well, but specifically Josh and Claudia, how have you helped someone else on this leadership journey? I actually uh, helped our uh, talent acquisition coordinator. She, uh, you know, kind of just talking. She normally did all our uh, admin stuff when I was a talent acquisition specialist. And so she, we were talking one day and she just said, you know, what do I need to do to be uh, in your position? Like, what do I need to be to, what do I need to do to be a talent acquisition specialist? Um, and so I kind of just started, you know, teaching her how I did things. Um, and um, I kind of started connecting her with the departments that I was assigned to um, so that she could start building that relationship with them. Because I thought eventually, if she does become a talent acquisition specialist, the easiest thing for her to take over would be the departments that I've already introduced her to and she's already built that relationship with. Um, so she actually got promoted uh, at the beginning of the year to a talent acquisition specialist. And um, she was actually able to take on uh, one of the big departments that I used to support. So that's, it, it wasn't anything formal. It was just a simple conversation. And, uh, you know, the desire that I wanted for her to be successful and be part of our team. That's good. Yeah, that's usually um, what you see is some type of desire, some type of communication that comes from a person in your circle. And they, they you got to pick up on it, but they're like, man, that's so cool. You're so, you're so good at that. And they'll say something like that. 
it comes natural. I wish I was as good as you are. And a funny thing is, you know, we were probably not always this good at what we're doing. Uh, we learned and, and we perfected it and we continue to refine our skills. In fact, um, development has not ever been, was never my strong suit. I had a, um, a guy that I worked with. He was, we were in sales for telecom. He was our best seller and I was his manager, his, his, uh, his store manager. And, you know, I'm coaching him there on numbers and stuff. And he said, can I tell you something? I said, yeah, sure. And he goes, it's, it's going to kind of sting and I don't want you to be offended. It was kind of that with all due respect, you know, statement. So I was like, yeah, sure. What? And he goes, I, I just feel like punching you in the face. That was his comment. And, you know, should it, should he have said it? Probably not, but I was really caught off guard. And I said, what, why would you even say that? This is random. Like, why did you say that? And he said, you know, I feel like I'm working really hard at this job. And I oftentimes you'll come and coach me and I do what you ask me to do. And I feel like I'm putting all my energy around what you want. And I don't ever feel like you reciprocate that. I don't feel like you're working for me. And I said, well, how am I not working for you? Like in my head, right? I'm thinking I get here on time. His schedule's pr produced on time. He goes on break when he schedules it. You know, anytime he needs help with the client, I step in and handle escort. Like in my mind, I'm supporting him. Like I'm doing everything I can for him. And um, he answered the question. He said, I want to be promoted. And you're doing nothing around getting me promoted. I, I think I deserve to be promoted and I want to be promoted. And what can you tell me that will allow me to get promoted? And so I um, started doing research. I, I felt like he made a good point to me. He's working really hard. What am I doing to develop his skills? And honestly, that became like a crux to my leadership style at work at Home is one of the key competencies that I began to get good at is not only being um, self-development, but also developing others around me. And how do I do that? Well, I took um, a leadership model. It's called the Extraordinary Leader. It's by um, Folkman and Z Zygman or some, I think that's his last name, but Folkman I know for sure and started analyzing and grading all of our all of my employees based on that model and i said here's what you're great at here's some areas you can improve on and then that cre created the basis for our conversation um those areas i know i'm good at that made me successful i told them that i said look i'm good at focusing on results if you want results i know how to get results whether in fitness and finance in, in business I know how to drive for results. That's just how I'm built. I know how to develop. I'm very active around, you know, self-development and I'll put myself in an uncomfortable position to get developed. Uh, but I also know that ownership or accountability is critical. I won't do something unless I know I have a mentor call with, with someone, right? Like I'm going to have to be accountable. And so I started to use that in all of my business, uh, in all of my personal life. And I built that out off of, you know, how, how we developed each other and how I talked through. I am much more advanced than I started. So I can see somebody's competencies. I know when they're high on interpersonal skills. I know when they are struggling to focus on results. But it also started from me just using that as a model to coach others and to really just re go back to that model. I didn't have it memorized. So there's literally a form that I would go through and grade them one through five. And um, so to close that story up, he ended up getting promoted. I went through the model with him. He got promoted. He, he moved to Dallas, I think at one point, but then that became the model I used and I, I moved on to another location 
And I was able to promote, I think it was at the point, 60% of the staff using that model. And now in our business, we have that as a conversation is here's what you're great at. Here's what we need to improve on, on yearly evaluations. It's not a, this is what you have to do. It's, this is what you can do if you want to get to the next level. And so um, there's those conversations, but honestly, it didn't come out of the blue. It was a weakness I had that somebody said, hey, I feel like punching you in the face. And that translated to me having a desire to get there. And, not, and now I love to do it. So, um, and uh, I won't give any credit to his name because I still think it was disrespectful. <laughs> well, it is, it is. Thank you for that. It is important for leaders to know when to humble themselves and give others those leadership responsibilities so that they can grow in their professional journey as well. It looks like we have a few questions from the floor. Our last question was really about COVID, but I think we covered that when we talked about mentee and mentor relationship during a digital world. So before I open it up to questions and answers, I wanna thank everybody for their participation in today's presentation. And we hope that you found some useful tips and are excited about you know, joining our mentor program. You can find, I think Jorge's gonna add it to our chat, but you can find both the mentor and the mentee applications on our site. It is alumni and friends dot uiw dot edu again that's alumni and friends there we go dot uiw dot edu but if you panelists are ready we're going to have everybody um, start their videos and mute themselves and we have some time for some questions before Jessica closes out our panel Hello, everybody. Do we have some questions for our panelists? I know we have some in the in the chat there. I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I have a question regarding the pandemic. Um, so we've been reading a lot, you know, everybody has been reading a lot of articles recently with, about the pandemic and the workplace environment. So I had read an early Microsoft report that showed that the, at the initiation of the pandemic, where corporations were shifting to a work from home, it found that employees were logging about two more hours of working when they were at home, as opposed to being at the office. So for the panelists, uh, what advice do you have for current students or entry level employees on how to handle work life balance and how not to burn out so quickly? That's, that's an awesome question. Um, what I, first off, what uh, to that point, um, I have been doing a lot of research and what I'm gonna, what I truly believe is my theory and what I'm gonna see is what we're gonna see is a true reform and restructure on how the American business is made. Now you're seeing a lot of corporations now that they're seeing more production from the from you know at home, they're looking at them saying to themselves, why do I have to spend hundreds of you know thousands of dollars on a lease on a building when I can you know lease you know maybe a quarter or even an eighth of that and have com uh, employees come in for a public use for it and mainly work out of the house and that can save me overhead costs. Um, that's something I really believe is going to happen after this um, is is um, comes out. Uh, when we return to our new normal, that's going to be the new normal, I believe. Uh, but what uh, the advice um, to your main point of your question that I um, that I would like to um, that I would like to address is just I, I really think planning and and I've been really I've been really bad at this in the past of uh, planning my day out and um, understanding how I can get my work done through A, B, and C. Um, college football really helped me a lot um, in kind of restructuring my mind, um, to, um, to make sure to plan out my day. Cause I mean, in, you know, when you're, when playing college football, your day is scheduled from 5.00 AM to 6.00 PM, whether it's practice weights, film class, study hall, more film, um, more weights. Um, it really gave me a sense of structure and how to structure my day. And uh, I really believe it's difficult to do that at the, at the house, because when you come home, I believe that's your relaxation point. 
you shove off everything that's happened throughout the day. Um, but maybe, and, and this is what I've uh, kind of seen uh, throughout working home a little bit, um, I am still going to the office, but a little bit working out of home has been designating a, a point in my house where this is my office space. And as soon as I walk out of that threshold, I'm out of work. I'm, that, that's me leaving the office, turning the key to my truck and driving down the highway, going home. And now I'm home. Um, I believe that that's worked for me. Um, I, I mean, that's the best advice that I can give to that question. Um, Good question, Martin. Um, so when the whole pandemic started for security service, um, there was, uh, you know, there was five, five uh, talent acquisition specialists on my team. Um, we immediately uh, got deployed to work from home. Uh, so the only time that I had to go to the office is when I had new employees or when I was onboarding them, which was made like once a month. Um, and then two months ago, we all uh, got the choice to become 100% remote. So I no longer have an office at the office. I had to go in and clean out my office and I am now 100% from home. And so some people chose to go into the office. Um, and so they uh, are the ones that are not 100% from home. They have to go in twice a week uh, into the office. And I guess the perk of, of going of not doing 100% is that you have an actual office. It was so hard to give up my office because as you go up the career ladder and you you know you get to to a position where you do have a private office, you know you have everything set up. Um, I, I just like I felt like it almost felt like being fired. To be honest with you, uh, it was so it was such a strange feeling. And I finally went in and cleaned out my office, brought everything home, and um, I think probably about a week ago, I finally uh, you know let it go. I don't have an office now. It's an office for people that are working 100% remote when they go to the office. There's different offices that they could use. That's you know they it's freed up some more space in the office. Whereas before. Um, you know, it was getting too crowded because there was too many of us and not enough offices. So, um, yeah, I mean that I, it, it was the way that I first started a hundred percent from home. Um, there was no structure to my time. There was no structure for when I had lunch, there was no structure when I took breaks. Um, and so for me, I had to actually schedule in those breaks into my calendar. So I take one hour lunch break every day between 12 and one. I either eat lunch or I either do, uh, uh, you know, uh, a short yoga practice. Um, and I take an afternoon break, 15 minutes, and I walk outside. And I have to tell you, ever since I started doing that, um, I started being more productive because I just felt like I was getting pulled every different direction. Uh, and now I finally feel like working from home is awesome now. You know, I get, I I get to make my own meals. Uh, I, I actually take care of myself better now. Once you get into that structured of putting everything in your calendar, um, and like you know, David said, uh, to have a separate desk. I, I bought a desk. I have a separate office. I have all the little things that I had in my office. I may not have the bigger space, but I do have a little corner, and I think that's that definitely helped me as well. Thank you, David and Claudia. Is there any other questions or comments? I have a question. Hi, Jackie. Hi. Um, so you, Claudia, you mentioned how you had to like restructure everything once you went 100% remote. I just want to know from all of you, like, how did you restructure, uh, like, maybe, like, individual time with anybody you're mentoring or anybody that mentored you like how did you like how long did it take to kind of like restructure that and and like how has it affected you uh overall well i'll speak to a little bit of that because we are a business that was mandated to shut down so across san antonio we had to close down um furlough a, a lot of our employees and there was a question on here you know what the difference between coaching and mentorship is and so I, I would say a lot of our employees were coaching um you know but I'm also on the council 
for the franchise at a national level. So I'm, I'm essentially mentoring other owners across the U S around the nine round brand. And I'm on the call with, I'm on calls with the CEO uh, when the pandemic hit daily, like as soon as it hit, we were on the call with him. He was mentoring us. And then I was on a, a call with a hundred Texas owners mentoring them on what to do next and giving them guidance. Um, so I'll say that's what changed immediately is our communication actually increased. It didn't decrease. Most people were like, you're closed. What are y'all doing? Y'all are not doing nothing. Y'all probably are going on vacation. And it's like, no, that's uh, our work increased. Our communication increased. All of our meetings increased. We were on Zoom calls all day long, just like you guys, you know, it didn't, it actually ramped up back to Martin's point. It's like, we worked a lot more than we ever have ever in the past. And then um, now it's really just an advantage. Like I was saying uh, with Dr. Lisa is that now we can have a meeting and all of our team joins and they know kind of the rhythm. We would, we would do virtual meetings before and we wouldn't have a lot of people on video, like they would just get on the phone. Now everybody's on video, they're chiming in, you know, they're comfortable with it and they feel very natural with it. Even some of our clients are only getting training uh, virtually versus through um, one-on-one or in-store. So I think, I think that's changed a lot, but overall the communication has just increased. There's been not not a, a decrease in activity with all this uh, pandemic going on to answer your question from our point of view. Thank you, Josh. That's a great, great question, Jackie. So we've, we've come to the end of the hour. Um, I just wanna say thank you to everyone and definitely thank you to our panelists for being so open and sharing your wonderful stories and knowledge with us this evening. Um, it is truly a very powerful resource to have a mentor and even more so to give back and have a mentee. So someone you can mentor. And to Josh's point earlier, don't be afraid to ask and put yourself out there. Uh, there's a quote by Isaac Newton. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And so in closing, I, I did want to share a little bit about how career services can play a part in your search for a mentor. Um, our office has many resources when it comes to career planning, and one of those key services are the networking events. Our office holds at least, at least 10 networking events a semester, and that includes student, alumni, and employer partners in attendance. And our services are extended to alumni for the rest of your life. So... <laughs> You, you can take advantage of those networking opportunities as well. Um, and these are, these are all ways to connect and build those, those networks so that in turn, you're not only um, you know, opening those doors to opportunity both professionally and personally, but you, you're there to build those long lasting relationships that can serve to bring those lifetime of opportunities, including finding a mentor or even turning that around for someone to be your mentee. So keep this in mind um, as you're looking for different prospects, prospects to open those doors. And this can only help place you on a more successful path in your career journey and find ways to get involved on campus with, with other departments and your faculty. We heard lots of stories about um, students connecting with specific departments and, and folks within those departments and, and more community. Um, so, so don't forget also to fill out the forms that have been provided in the chat room. Um, if, if you are indeed interested in being a mentor or um, need or being a mentee. So uh, again, thank you to our panelists and everyone.